Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Etting from H.R. Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Michael, if there's one thing I can, uh, I hate using this expression, geek out over <laughs> more than like anything else. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of things, actually. There's it's, a lot it's, of, it's there's a lot lot of, of answers. I mean, you have a, a whole nother podcast. That's true. <laughs> but if there's one thing that I deep down love most of all, yeah, it is World's Fairs. Yeah. Um, and anybody who could see my office or my apartment would understand mm-hmm. because it is just littered with World's Fair souvenirs. So today we're going to be talking to Rick Barrett, who wrote a very well-received book. Award-winning. On, an award-winning book about the men who printed Cinderella's for the 1901 Buffalo Pan American Exposition, mm-hmm. which sounds like a very niche book or maybe a good article. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily sound like something where you'd be like, I want to read a, an entire book about this. And then you read the book and you, like, you, you're left wanting more. Yeah. It's one of these stories that you it wouldn't occur to you that, that this could be as interesting as it is. Um, but, but, but here, here's this exceptional book. Um, and, and again, just anyone who researches and writes about a a world's fair like this, um, is somebody, I have a pretty good hunch and and just from watching his stamp chats, I have a pretty good hunch. This is somebody we're going to get along with. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, I'm looking forward to all of these, of course, but uh, we say this a lot. We always say I'm looking forward to this and it's never not true. Yeah. Uh, no, um, this is this, 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 is this be one in one. particular. This, this is like on my wavelength. This yeah. is like 1901 World's Fair. Like that's my sweet spot. Yeah. That's like I, a I've heard you talk mile about hour. World's Fair so much that yes. I'm excited to just see your interaction. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm into this one. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry if this one uh, goes off the rails. No, no, no. Like, I mean, the, like, the, the, the book know, itself World's Fair stuff. isn't isn't a deep dive into stamps. It's it's evaluating I the love, entire it's almost like there's a great little book written about the one set magenta that's being sold next month mm-hmm. or in two months yeah. um where it's not three months it's not so much about the magenta the magenta mm-hmm. is what it is it's the one set yeah. magenta. but it's these stories and again this yeah. isn't even necessarily about cinderella's from a world's fair it's about yeah. so much more than that and that's why i i love what rick is doing and i'm really excited for us to talk with him yeah let's uh let's bring him on let's do it all right here we go Hello. Hi, Rick. Hello. How's it going? Both Michael and Charles. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So, so to kick things off, before we get into the the specifics of of your your wonderful book, can you sort of give us your own personal journey in philately? How you uh, how you got interested? How you started collecting? What's your own your own story? Well, you know, I was thinking. Um, that looking back, I, I got my first stamp album at, at the age of 10, but um, I really had several influences. Um, my best friend, since I was very small, and his dad was a stamp collector, and so I would always see uh, Bobby's dad uh, with his album, kind of wondering what that was, and all the, the drawer with all the duplicates, and once it, which um, he bought me um, my first stamp album. And then my late uncle, uh, whenever he would come east, uh, he would ask about my interests and things like that. And uh, he's fueled it a lot and made it fun. Um, And and I was so grateful for that. And it wasn't long after, you know, was involved uh, through my uncle's letters that I joined a, a stamp club in the small town we lived in. And uh, I guess around the time I was 13, my grandfather, who'd been a stamp collector, oh boy, he bought tights centers and all those different, just had zillions of them. Um, they all wound up get, getting moved in his estate, what couldn't get used on mail at the time. But uh, um, I was given uh, boxes of basically covers, just, just probably 15 or 20 boxes of, of envelopes from the 30s to the early 70s. 
that they never threw anything out. They just fill up a box and put it on another shelf. And, and uh, so I was given those and, and that's really where I, I got the bug. Um, I started reading uh, uh, the Harris catalog, um, H.E. Harris. And, and uh, I remember being in the uh, uh, English class in eighth grade and we're supposed to be reading, I don't know, Old Yeller or Cheaper by the Dozen, but I've got my Harris catalog in the, the middle of the book and I was memorizing the, the numbers, the Scots numbers. And, and uh, I, I got caught one day and uh, thank goodness the uh, uh, teacher for that class uh, uh, asked what I was reading and uh, he said, oh, I'm a stamp collector too. He said, just put it away for now. So uh, um, that was great. And uh, there was a junior high stamp club I got involved in. Um, and uh, my, uh, let's see, he was my math teacher and he was wonderful. He, he not only encouraged us through, um, you know, the various things about hinges and things like that and catalogs. And, but on a Saturday, he took us to a, a nearby uh, stamp show. Um, it was at a, I think it was a closed down department store, the downstairs, but they had tables where all the, the dealers were. And I remember sitting at the, the kids table with my buddy. Uh, he had gone as well. And um, uh, we were, there were just piles of stamps on this table and we were allowed to go through and take whatever we enjoyed. And, and uh, so those were really um, things that, that formed the foundation of my interest in the hobby. And boy, the uh, uh, processing and sorting and of all those covers uh, just took months and months. And now I kind of wish I hadn't, you know, torn the stamps off of those things. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when you're a youngster, you just do. And, and we, uh, oh boy, the bathtub was always full of stamps. And, you know, my mother would yell my name and say, you know, get these stamps out of here. And, and uh, I'd put them on newspapers and, and uh, let them dry. And then I set up a little, uh, um, you know, duplicate system as well. And uh, I, I saw my uncle's, his was uh, using envelopes that were supposed to be for Sunday church donations. Uh, they had the, the dates on them. Well, he didn't donate as a youngster. He put his stamps in those. So uh, I, I got a bunch of glassine envelopes and wrote the number on it. And, and uh, I was off and running. So I, um, I think the last thing is that it, it led me to um, uh, work in a stamp store uh, for three years as a young teenager. We had two stamp stores um, in where I grew up, and one was really nice. And, uh, you know, if you went in there, everything was in order. There was a beautiful lighting. Uh, there was coffee and cookies on the side, and they charged a lot more for mm. those stamps. And, uh, and now I look back, they probably had some quality things. Well, there was another stamp store that was, you know, a lot of hodgepodge stuff and piles of things everywhere. And I loved that. And that's where I got to sort stamps and learn about things. And I'd watch people come in and, and uh, look for things and sell their, um, their books. I saw so many people that uh, were college age that had been collectors brought their books in and said, I want to get whatever I can for it. And then I saw so many others that were maybe early middle age that would come in and say, I used to be a collector. I would like to buy another album and start again because I enjoyed it so much. So when I saw that dynamic, I pretty much said to myself, I'm never going to sell my, my album. In fact, that that's it right back there. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's the, the national album. So I'm, I'm glad that I didn't and uh, I didn't have to start again. So I think everyone, everyone with their baseball cards these days too. Adam is mm. a kid in the age. You hear that same thing pop up with Clay, but it's, it's amazing that you had that firsthand experience and were able to uh, therefore avoid the pitfall that so many people, uh, <laughs> you know, fall into. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of parallels. Yeah, a lot of real parallels. You're right, Charles. And uh, um, you know, I did. You know, when I I did move from Buffalo to Houston, went to the University of Houston, and and uh, have stayed here, but. Uh, I, I probably had a, a long dormant time, um, but I joined the APS in the early 80s, and uh, I guess I'll be coming up on 40 years now. Wow. And uh, um, 
I wasn't that active in the hobby. I would buy a few things through approvals. Um, I did a few auctions uh, and buy things in a couple auctions um, that were, um, you know, intriguing. And uh, that kept my foot in the door, so to speak. And uh, uh, I've, I've never lost my love for stamps. Let's put it that way. I love that story. I love that that there were teachers there who, who helped you as well and, and who had an interest in, in, you know, education first, but then stamps later, stamps on the weekend. That's, that's something that I think a lot of people are, they, they look for. They say, how do we, how can we get stamps in the classroom? And, and we don't really think about the fact that the, the way we get stamps in the classroom is by kind of trying to find the, the philatelists who are also teachers <laughs> maybe you know uh absolutely i think i think you know one of your prior conversations you know put it you know beautifully a uh, stamps as a teaching tool and mm. and uh you know i'm in a um, a club locally the houston philatelic society and and our president is a teacher she's oh, yeah. uh, a real champion for um spreading the the uh fun of philately to her students regardless of what the method is, whether it's through topicals or, or history or geography or whatever. And I, I'm so grateful that she does that. Yeah, I, I think it's out there. And I think we just need to raise more kind of awareness in, in the field of philately that, that people are kind of taking it upon themselves to, to, to bring stamps to people individually, uh, not as a massive organization. And it's just... Uh, you know, time we kind of find those people and, and bring them into organized philately as well. Absolutely. Another fellow in our club um, is been in, in, uh, entrusted with uh, dealing with the kids table at our uh, annual Greater Houston Stamp Show. And uh, he gets a lot of donations through the years, uh, through the year, and then sets up the table and recruits a lot of volunteers to give things away to help hopefully start kids in the hobby. Um, and then um, here where the Houston Astros play at Minute Maid Park, they set up a, a table once a year, uh, once a season to uh, do the same thing. And uh, I think they have another activity at the Children's Museum, something with the Boy Scouts. And, you know, it, it does take being proactive to uh, attract uh, people to our hobby. And I'm so glad there's folks out there that are interested in doing that. Well, when you talk about the different methods, uh, different ways to get people interested in the hobby, I, I think that's a great segue into your book because what I love so much about it is, I'm going to say something that may sound weird. It, it's not necessarily a philatelic book, though. This is not a survey of rates or roots or you know printing, plating a stamp. This is a a very uh, uh, human story. This is, and and I think that you know, as evidenced by a book like um, Devil in the White City, there's already a lot of interest in. World's Fairs to begin with. Um, sure. And we can talk more about World's Fairs after because that's something I'm, I'm super passionate about. But I think your book is is the perfect example of a um, non-philatelic story that uses stamps as a, you know, a plot device almost. Um, and, 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 and certainly there is a, a huge, I'm not saying it's non-philatelic, there's a huge philatelic component. But, but what I mean by that is, again, it's not, um, the intended audience is not necessarily people who are already uh, all in on the hobby. Can you talk a little bit about how this story came to you? Obviously, you've got roots in Buffalo, but but can you talk a little bit about the, the premise behind this and how you can tell a captivating, uh, again, very human story uh, that, that happens to involve uh, postage stamps or, or Cinderella's in your case? Well, well, I can tell you, Charles, that it was never planned. I think that was one of the, the cool aspects of it. Um, my whole... Uh, interest began just to try and document the stamps themselves. And then somehow, and I, I can't really put it together, but I got interested in the, the people behind it, just myself as a, a you know, and a thing to be interested in. And so I did a little reading and research about it. And then it just was organic and, and, you know, played out itself. And, and, uh, you know, that idea for a, what I thought would be a 16 page pamphlet with, you know, a bunch of pictures of the stamps, which essentially became the stamp appendix, uh, 24 page stamp appendix is what really, you know, that aspect was. But, um, you know, I, I was so interested in a couple things, the people that were behind it, 
And then when I was encouraged, uh, as I mentioned in, in several uh, things in the book and, and uh, you know, in talks, I was encouraged by a, a local stamp dealer friend uh, who's become a wonderful uh, buddy and uh, to pursue it and just see where the story leads me. And, you know, what began in 2012, I thought would be done pretty soon. And it just kept going and going and going because there was more story to tell. Uh, I also, um, I, I'm a researcher uh, in a sense by trade and uh, I just love getting background information of things. You know, I've done so much product writing as a profession. And when you do ample background work, you're able to then tell a broader story and hopefully uh, make it a more enticing piece. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like going to a flea market and finding a, an old gem in a dusty box full of things. And the same thing hit me by going to different philatelic libraries, the first being the APRL, you know, that was, boy, I mean, I remember being there the first morning at eight o'clock in the morning and, and seeing this stack of books that had been set aside for me. And I thought, <laughs> I want to move to Belfont. I would, I'd like to live here. You know? <laughs> it, it was terrific. And um, so, um, you know, I think that's how the, the idea just kind of kept, um, it grew, obviously. Um, I'm really glad that it it didn't uh, just stay with the expo itself because there's so much written on the expo and um, yet I needed to provide a little bit of background on that. There's a chapter in there about, you know, what it meant to our city and things like that. And I did have a, a, a bit of a, an agenda there uh, writing that chapter, but, you know, I tried to keep the focus um, pretty much on those two fellas as it pertained to their lives and use the, the stamps uh, as a, a foundation or a background for their, their uh, stories. Because they were immersed in the hobby pretty mm -hmm. much from their early years until the end of their lives themselves. So uh, that, that was really thrilling. Um, I want to say the, the uh, Pan American Expo chapter itself, I had a, um, a you know, I'd been collecting those items as well. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that whatever was presented in on those pages was accurate and um, enticing to read, uh, a good story was told, you know, and, and actually when going through a lot of materials, they pretty much focused on, you know, what a big fair it was, and then that President McKinley had been shot there. And, and that was such a huge part of it. And my agenda was, you know, with pride for my city where I grew up, I said, I want a more positive, you know, outlook of this thing. And so uh, a member of the Pan American Exposition Collectors Club that I had been in and, and am still in, it's not a large club, but it's a dedicated club, included a, a, a fellow who was a professor at the University of Buffalo. He's written his own book and he's amassed an incredible collection of things and uh, just a terrific guy. And so I asked him if he would be willing to proofread my chapter on that. And, and he was, and what was really nice, there was a few typos and things like that to correct, but, but one of his comments stuck with me in that, you know, this is one of the most positive um, overviews of the expo that he's read. And that's what I wanted to do. It was so much more than than um, the assassination of our president. It was a huge thing for our community and uh, and those that got to visit. It, it was really fun. So, um, you know, I guess I can say because of all the the product writing and 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 things that I've I've put together before is that I, I guess I'm a, a storyteller by trade, um, and I enjoy that. I certainly can uh, talk about a lot of different things and and uh and grateful for that and uh so uh, it seemed to come out in the the pages as as i put it together and you're exactly right about how the assassination is sort of this cloud that hangs over the expo and and, and rightfully so obviously that's that's one of the sure. most you know momentous uh, days in in you know modern american history of the last 125 years but but you know when you look at the pictures and when you think about how 
Uh, electricity was still a, a novel concept to a lot of people. And, and, and you know, you're right when you think about it. And I say this because I was actually flying to Belfont um, for the grand opening of the new APRL. Yeah. And uh, my flight to New York got canceled, so all they could do was stick me on a plane to Buffalo, oh. and which, which is a very long drive to Belfont. I think it's about a six-hour drive to Belfont with, like, no interstate highways. Um, but I thought I've never been to Buffalo before, and there was a World's Fair there. My, one of my goals in life is to visit the sites of every world, every American World's Fair. Wonderful. Um, so, I, I, you know, my grandmother was at the 39 New York World's Fair. My father was at 64 New York. Um, yeah, I've been to uh, Seattle. I've been to as many as I can. And I thought Buffalo, that's World's Fair City. I have to, I have to go there. So literally, I got off the plane and went straight to the um, the Buffalo History Museum. Is the sole surviving building, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And when you when you think again, the the assassination is almost um, totally uh, divorced and removed from the rest of the fair, which was, by all accounts, incredibly successful. Brought an incredible number of people to Buffalo and, and really was a, a, a shining moment in, uh, in, in, a, you know, in, in another, you know, it's a very historic city outside of the fair. Um, so I, 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 I love your approach that it's positive and upbeat rather than just saying, you know, this is, this is where the president was shot. There, there's so much more to it, so much more complexity. Um, and, and again, as a, as a world's fair junkie myself, I, I, re- I loved experiencing that going to Buffalo and, uh, you know, just yeah. trying to imagine. And it's, uh, we talked in email a little bit before this. It's a weirdly residential neighborhood now where the fair was held. <laughs> and these are all really old homes. These are homes that go back to the teens and 20s. So you feel like you're in an old neighborhood. And then you look at the pictures and you say, wait a minute, that was <laughs> you try you just trying to visualize it. And it's, it's totally bizarre. You know, uh, Omaha, Nebraska is still an open field. And uh, obviously, Chicago still has the Museum of Science and Industry, uh, but but Buffalo's this again. It's it's a it's a nice nice little neighborhood, and you just think about the the you know uh, countless number of people who who walked right there. Yeah, yeah, you bring up so many great points. I mean, um, the uh, neighborhood itself with those old homes. I just got uh, last weekend a, a visitor's guide to the expo that I had not seen before, and it was primarily focused on train schedules and different, there were so many trains coming into Buffalo at the time, but it also had a section on uh, those old homes being able to rent rooms to people that came in and what the rates were, you know, uh, 50 cents a night, a dollar a night, boy, uh, 250 was like a big deal. You know, that's like staying at the, uh, the plaza in New York or, or the, you know, something like that. It was, it was wonderful. And, so that's what those old homes uh, um, still represent. Uh, you know, there was four months, a little over, of really terrific things that occurred before the assassination, you know. And there's only a couple uh, months afterwards. In fact, they did have the biggest crowds after the assassination. And uh, uh, But um, there were so many different days, uh, you know, that were... Um, and there's Rhode Island Day, and there's the Veterans Day, and there's, you know, all these different special days that were used to attract people. Uh, so many conventions, the, uh, you know, a couple of philatelic conventions were one week after another uh, in August, mid-August there. And uh, uh, so there were a variety of things. You know, the attraction of Niagara Falls was a big thing for travelers to enjoy and see. And, and uh, I'm sure the hospitality industry was promoting a variety of things as well to entice people to come. There was over 8 million people that came. And to go off on a fully non-philatelic tangent, if that's okay, because sure. Mike, Michael, you noticed me perking up, because if we talk about yeah. World's Fairs, I'm, <laughs> I'm in. When do you get more World's Fair people on? Um, no offense to our other guests. This is what really uh, gets me going. But but uh, the Pan Am is where, didn't they have the um, Flight to the Moon ride as well? Yes, yes. Where it, it's it simulated a trip to the moon, and then you would get off, and they would have people dressed as uh, <laughs> uh, selenites or whatever they would call them back. It, it was based on the, the George Millier film, basically, yes, and the, yeah. the uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells novels. But, you know, it's sort of the one of the births, and then that ride went to Coney Island afterwards, I think. Oh, really? I didn't so, know I, that. I believe so. But yeah, it's sort of the birth of, like, modern amusement parks in a way as well. 
Uh, you yeah. know, you think of the, the Ferris wheel at, at um, Chicago, obviously. Sure. Um, so these these World Fairs are are so connected to life. Within the, I was looking at one of our lots in our next sale, the pamphlets for Singer sewing machines. Yeah. They're these brands that are still there. To, uh, it, it's on the one hand so far removed from our society. You know, you look at pictures and it, it looks like a different era. Um, but there's so many threads that that can connect to our lives today that. I think that those early fairs in particular, you've got St. Louis, you've got Omaha, you've got Buffalo, obviously, are just are just so interesting in so many ways. Sure, sure. The the Midway was a, a pretty cool thing. It was uh, closed on Sundays, by the way, because a lot of those attractions were considered, uh, you know, not godly, I guess. Um, besides the uh, trip to the moon, Dreamland was a wonderful thing. If, if you Google uh, Dreamland Pan American Exposition, the outside of Dreamland was like this giant lady's head that you would walk through, uh, you know, to get inside to whatever in dreams they had going on there. And and uh, but it, it was a real, uh, you know, um, just a, a great draw. The imagination that was behind all this was wonderful. And and like you mentioned, um, corporate entities, you know, they wanted to have their name out there because so many people were. Um, coming and uh, you know singer there's a uh, you know a famous cover with singer uh, uh, sewing machines uh, in the corner card on a, a big picture of Niagara Falls a cachet of that um, there's pamphlets from that and and that's just one of hundreds that that were out there and uh, I, I too find this very fascinating I, I was uh, uh, lucky to be at the the 1964-65 New York World's Fair. It was the first time I ever rode on a plane with my my grandmother and and grandfather. And uh, boy, it was the same thing for me through a child's eyes to be able to see the the wonder of all the you know the Unisphere and and the big uh, the General Motors uh, tire and things like that. It's like where have we landed? Everyone asks me today why World's Fairs are not still a thing, and I explain mm-hmm. that they are kind of a thing internationally. And the U.S. doesn't chooses not to participate, but but for a time, you know, for for a seventy five year period there, I would say you know through the even going into the I, I guess um, uh, eighty four Louisiana was kind of the right the last the last big one, but but for a time this was a really important part of American culture. And again, there's so many. I, I brought up Devil in the White City earlier, which is admittedly a much darker story than the one you tell but there are so many uh of, of these little and, and you know just in, in I've, 39 new york is my favorite and and there's so many of these great little stories that um that, that uh I, I think the sum total of all of them is, is what makes these world's fairs so interesting and you know so appealing uh, the, the other thing i think is fascinating is that they were all effectively built to be um transitory they, they were right. they were made to be demolished by their very nature you know, so many great buildings get demolished, you know, for, for, but the world's fairs were designed to be temporary. Yeah. And I think that adds to their intrigue as well, that, that they, they couldn't have existed for more than two seasons. Sure. See it while you can. It's pretty yeah. cool that, you know, so many artifacts from the, that 3940 world's fair are there in what is it? Queens or forest Hills. Um, yep. you know, that's wonderful. My, my late brother collected 3940 uh, artifacts. So, uh, I'm familiar with a lot of those. And uh, I went to Knoxville, uh, just happened to be driving up north, possibly to Buffalo. But we, we went to the Knoxville World's Fair in 82 and then uh, did go to the 84 one in New Orleans because it's close. Um, but um, my wife asked me recently, why don't they do it anymore? And I, I just imagine it's it's got to be cost. It must it would cost. It'd be like putting on the Olympics. It must mm, cost yeah. billions to do that. And- and 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 don't quote me, but I think I read somewhere that the, to join the World's Fair governing body, it's like like the the um, the UPU of World's Fairs sure. is only like a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand dollars, which for the U.S. budget is right. less than nothing. Um, but we just stop paying our dues, and that's why we don't participate uh, anymore. It's like that, like they can't shove that into some unrelated bill just to get us back in the world's fair game well you you would think that some corporate entity like starbucks or somebody would say hey we'll pay the dues let's get back in it and promote our, exactly. our brand I, I was, even the fords and the general you know the companies sure. that were a big part of these early world fairs the, the yeah. other thing i wanted to ask you a little bit about though is it's just sort of um you're, you're from buffalo originally yeah and and this city has a great history when, when i visited i went to the uh city hall is one of the sure. greatest Absolutely. art deco buildings i've ever seen 
Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the concert hall was a, a very early designed by Eero Sarinen, I believe. Um, uh, Kleinhans? The, or a different one? I don't remember the name of it, but it was a very yeah. early modernist. Uh, Shays Buffalo Theater? Is that the one that looks like a horseshoe, like a brick horseshoe? Gosh, I don't know. It's been. I'm going to look this up. Yeah, yeah. I've been to Shays at, at uh, a concert there. I set the last row in 1975 to see Bruce Springsteen, and and Shays Buffalo is a gorgeous uh, venue. There were there were a, like dozens of uh, theaters down Main Street in Buffalo. It was you know because of vaudeville and things. And the one I'm thinking of. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I said when air conditioning came about, people came to just be inside there in the summer. But <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. The one I was thinking of is uh, Kleinhans. Kleinhans Music Hall. Yeah, that's. Yep. Oh, that, that's it's, where I saw Springsteen. It, 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 acoustically superb, and uh, it was a big deal for them in the '70s to even introduce rock concerts. Of uh, they wanted it to be, you know, um, a more mellow. Uh, you know, Jerry Vale, Andy Williams, whatever, that type of performer. And uh, so that the seats wouldn't get messed up, I guess. But, uh, um, you know, it's it's a wonderful venue. Still still in operation. So Buffalo's got this great history. And, you know, in the 20s, 30s, you know, uh, you take a song like Shuffle Off to Buffalo. This was uh, this was a, a, a major city. And um, and, and uh, you know, I, like like much of upstate New York, I guess it's its reputation has you know, as a lot of the industry, uh, you know, has, has left, you know, Buffalo is not as integral. And, and as you know, you talk about the, even just the trains to the, the expo, the, the, the connectedness with trains and the canals and everything. Sure. So what, you know, what, what is your take on how Buffalo has, has evolved since the expo in 1901? Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's a rhythm of life, first of all. And I'm, I'm that we definitely had a valley there caused by several things. The distribution and the train system all shifted when the Erie Canal opened and the St. Lawrence Seaway opened and everybody could then go to uh, distribute more uh, centrally in America through Chicago, Gary, Indiana, and they just bypassed Buffalo as a distribution place. Uh, it wasn't as necessary, they felt. Um, I mean, there were, there were uh, I wanna say a couple dozen automobile manufacturing factories there Packard and things like that, and, and uh, Pierce Arrow and whatever. Um, but not only that, is then, you know, in the 60s, when the steel industry, uh, through various things, uh, the price of steel became so much that uh, entities would purchase it from Japan and overseas steel because ours was too much. So the steel mills closed. Uh, they consolidated. A lot of them actually, Bethlehem Steel was like a, its own little city, went to Pennsylvania, I think downsized there, but uh, those are just two brief things. Um, I am so proud though, because I still follow the city. My mom is is there and I, I look forward to going back very soon when uh, the APRL was able to have people for extended periods again. Um, but it's, I, I've you know been pleased as I follow it, uh, that it's regularly voted one of the friendliest cities uh, in America. Uh, it's it's a little gem that people don't necessarily know about. It's it's definitely coming back economically. And um, it's got the it's got the anchor bar, which is <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's all you that's all you need right there. That, that's right. Oh, there's so many restaurants. That, you know, there's. The, I, I loved my 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 time there was incredible. And again, just the history and the architecture and everything. I think it really is one of the great underappreciated American cities. It it is. You've got the falls. Niagara Falls is 20 minutes away. Um, you know, you can go to Toronto. It's only 80 miles, which is a, a definitely a, a cosmopolitan and worldly city. Uh, it's it's wonderful, uh, despite the the big snow aspect of it. That really hasn't uh, been that way. Uh, the snow in the 70s is not what it is today. Uh, it's a little more unpredictable, but you've got a, a bit more temperate uh, climate now. Um, and uh, it really is a, a, a nice community. It's, it's a great place to, to point out the uh, McKinley connection again. You know, there's two sports teams, the, the football Bills and the Hockey Sabres. You know, the, the line is, is that they've never won anything because of the curse of McKinley. 
Well, you get your, your contribution to the history of a, a really great city, I think, is, is amazing. That's that's what I love about the, the book so much. Well, again, I, you see behind me, these are all philatelic books, and yes. and a lot of them are useful when I need something, but they're not they're not a, a, the type of book I would ever um, pick up and and uh, enjoy on its own merits. Yes. Uh, whereas, again, a, a book like yours that that is, it fits it's like a puzzle piece into the larger history of of the expo and the city at large. I think is is what makes it so fantastic. One of the other things about the the book that you know you mentioned and things are are that you know as as the stories began to tell themselves. I mean, I was taking out books from the APRL by mail. You can take out five a month. You can take out books from the Collectors Club in New York, uh, the Western Philatelic Library, the Rocky Mountain uh, Philatelic Library. You can get. I was getting stacks of books and. I, I literally went through page by page of, uh, I counted it up once, it was more than 50,000 pages of wow. 1880s and 1890s stamp journals to find anything on these two folks. Again, I love, it's like poking around at the flea market, and, and, and that's what I did. Um, but, uh, you know, what seemed to uh, come about was that this book, as you said, it's not just a philatelic book. And in a, in a way, that was probably good. I, I chose to self-publish it. And, um, you know, when you put out a philatelic book, unless it's, um, you know, a, really got the, the strength of, of uh, a larger philatelic entity behind it, Amos Press or, or Linz or, or the APS, um, and, and I was offered those opportunities, but I, I also did something very different. I started marketing my book uh, what turns out to be five years before I self-published, and that's and I do a lot of marketing, so I put it, you know, postcards out and and uh, notices out that this would be coming soon. In fact, I had to buy stickers to put over the postcards to change the years from 2016 <laughs> to 2017 to 2018. And uh, but uh, you know, to have a a self-published philatelic book um, sell a hundred copies is like being on the New York Times bestseller list. And so by having this, um, you know, be under an umbrella that wasn't just philatelic, but also uh, historical biographies that could be of interest to anyone, um, you know, that allowed me to broaden it. And I published 350 and um, I've sold 300. So it's been a fun ride. So you you had about um, 300 some images throughout the book itself. Um, how many of those items in there were yours as compared to unique items that you had to pull from somewhere else or or stuff like that? How many of those were actually in your collection? Interesting. Um, well, the advertisements uh, that came from those stamp journals that I was going through, um, those and the newspaper notices were just digital images that I mm -hmm. had, you know, like I would take pictures uh, uh, or get scans of those. Um, but everything else was mine. And uh, I, I want to say that I think there's four or five covers that I picture in there that came from friends that were providing me with other information and things. Mm -hmm. There's a spread in the book that's got um, maybe four pages or six pages of um, color covers. Um, and uh, I, as I think back, I, I believe that maybe all but three of those were are in my collection still. So, uh, in fact, I just read the, the uh, Harmer email that was circulated today about specialty collections. So uh, that was quite interesting. And uh, um, that was my train ride this morning was composing <laughs> that. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, it's in the back of my mind, and uh, um, you know the stamps themselves and and those that came in the that show up in the appendix i think there's only um uh, you know the hubble stamps are definitely accessible the hail stamps those are very difficult and i i believe i only know two people that i can recall have the a full set besides myself i was so grateful to be able to piggyback on their awareness and knowledge and and their scans so that I, I just lucked out and, and wound up completing a set. Uh, you know, there's there's stamps in there that um, are very similar to each other. Uh, the hail stamps I'm talking about, 
there's violet blue and slate blue. And as I was getting ready to wrap things up, certainly the, the stamp appendix, um, I had a real tough time uh, discerning them. I, I talked mm -hmm. to several people in the Houston Philatelic Society. You know, these fellows had said, look, at there's there's two varieties. I also found a, a French catalog from 1914 from the Collectors Club that uh, I had to get translated because I didn't quite understand everything. But but they documented those same stamps without the pictures. And uh, and they said there was two different colors. And so we chose to call them slate blue and, and violet blue. And uh, I said to someone who's, who's actually an accredited judge in our uh, stamp club, I said, I'm having so much trouble. I said, and we were in our, our meeting, you know, where we meet at the church and fluorescent light and I had a flashlight and all this stuff. And he said, you know what you need? is natural light. And when I went outside, and it's hot in Texas, so I actually took a bunch of these stamps and I sat in the back seat of my car on a sunny day uh, and had the air conditioner on. And when I looked through the uh, magnifying glass I took, it just jumped out. Hmm. And it was like, wow, I can see the differences now. And that was really fun to do. And, uh, you know, um, I tried to make stands and and provide examples in the, the book so that you can see the difference. But anyone that's trying to collect those, um, natural light is the way to go. And uh, um, so uh, I, uh, I, I believe that besides the stamps that I picture there that are in my collection, um, I didn't even know whether I had them all or whether I'd have to request um, examples from my two colleagues that I'd cross paths with. And uh, I had a full set, and I believe I have a second set, uh, although the only way I can complete it would be to break up a block. Mm. And and I don't know whether I would do that. I might or might not someday. But uh, the hail stamps are real um, uh, challenges to, to try and complete. You can probably get about uh, 40 or 50 of the 86 varieties besides the, the six imperps. And... Uh, but boy, the, the others are real difficult. Metallic uh, varieties are tough. So, Is that just because they're so scarce or because they're, they're uh, not unique, obviously, but, but uh, valuable or, or what's... Yeah, the, the, um, uh, I believe the scarcity is a couple, twofold. One, the fellow that printed them for Mr. Hale uh, didn't get paid, as the story goes, and that's documented in several places. And so this fellow that printed them, Alfred Baguette, in fact, he printed stamps for the 1900 Paris Exposition. Um, so he, he was a printer and actually a forger later on in his <laughs> career, uh, like Hale was. And uh, uh, so um, what Baguette did was he had to wholesale this stock to other dealers. And he did so in Belgium, uh, France, where he was. Uh, England and India. And the only place I've ever been able to find examples uh, has been India or England. I got two large dealer lots. Actually, uh, uh, the fellow in India uh, came up with a second one. So I've got a couple lots from him and one from uh, Great Britain. But um, I don't know where the rest wound up. And, hmm. and you know, uh, in fact, it did 20, New York 2016, in the Javits Center, I was so grateful to meet um, some fellows, uh, collectors from India, and I, I showed them, the book hadn't come out yet, and I showed them to them, and I said, is there any way that you can spread the word about these? And and he said, sure, I'll be happy to. Give me your email address, and here's mine, and give me the information, uh, and I'll be happy to spread it. So um, thank you for the, the uh, stamp collecting community. Yeah. And then my last question, I've worked on a couple of um, big non-philatelic projects uh, myself, and I always feel like when, uh, you know, when, when you put years of your life into something, uh, it's amazing when it eventually comes out. But I feel like there's almost, I don't want to say a letdown, that's the wrong word. Um, but, but when it's done, you sort of look around and you think like, what do I, what do I do now? So obviously you've remained interested in, in collecting uh, these Cinderella's, but, but what is, uh, what would you say is next for you now that, 
now that you've written the Bible, you've written, you know, effectively all there is to be written about this subject. Where do you see yourself going from here? Well, well, thanks for asking. You know, I, I like to say, I say in, in the beginning of the book that I'm not an expert on stamps, but I do feel that, you know, stamp collecting is like a beach and there are so many grains of sand on that beach. And I happen to be the guy that knows the most about that one grain of sand. And, and that's kind of thrilling, actually. And, and my interest is still really high. Since I self-published, um, I still uh, go to other 1890s stamp journals that I wasn't able to check out uh, from the libraries and uh, you know have to see them in person. So uh, my interest is still high. I have a, a file in my laptop that's full of images of things that you know I've acquired um, after the publishing of the book. One of them being a picture of the gentleman uh, during his early stamp years. You know, I found a picture of him in his uh, late 70s, early 80s. There's three or four pictures there. There's a picture of him in a trade magazine uh, when he was in corporate America in his mid 40s. But I finally found one um, from a large group photo at a stamp convention. And, uh, you know, that that was a real thrill to see him as a young man. So my interest is still very high in that. Um, as far as other things, um, I have enough material to consider writing another book just on the Huckster. Uh, his life was absolutely incredible. I swear it could be a, um, you know, a one hour, one hour TV show that, would, you know, most shows uh, have 42 minutes of content that would really be fun to do. Um, but uh, I, I don't think I'll publish another book like this one, um, I might do an ebook of his life. Um, and I actually have ideas for five other books. So uh, some of it um, uh, depends on the material that I can find. Um, I have a, um, my late uncle, the one that got me into stamps, in fact, my uh, stamp club teacher in eighth grade asked me if I got anything recently from Uncle Stamps. So he was Uncle Stamps. Well, he had a, uh, uh, he lived in San Francisco and had a beautiful uh, book of postcards that was in, they were three to a page on a beautiful black pages. And it was on, it was like seeing a, an old Bible opened in your, you know, on a stand in a living room. Well, these were 1906 San Francisco um, earthquake postcards that were also, they were vintage and they were also from our family. His great grandfather mailed them back to Buffalo to family members. And so my hope is, is that those surface and that those could be scanned, transcribed, and that story could be told. Uh, I have another set of 84 postcards from my late uncle that uh, when he was 15 years old, his buddy moved from Buffalo to Pittsburgh. And so after his, uh, when he was 15, after his school year ended, he got his bike and went on a train to Pittsburgh and he and his buddy Eddie rode the bike for three weeks to across uh, to Eastern Pennsylvania and then South to Washington, DC and then back. And every day he sent three or four postcards back to Buffalo to his mom or himself. And then he wrote the proverbial what I did on my summer vacation um, as a 15 year old. And that we're trying to find that. I have the 84 postcards. I have a typed uh, version of it as an adult that he wrote when he was 70. And I would like to drive that route. This was all pre-interstate. And uh, I've, I've bought an early 40s map of the Eastern seaboard and I've plotted it out through the postcards themselves. And I'd like to drive that and then type up a, uh, um, a book or a story on his adventure. I think it'd be a a charming thing. So, and then I have a couple other ideas, but uh, uh, I love writing articles. Um, I hope to have at least one, maybe two other articles in the philatelic community um, and dip my, keep my toes in the water, so to speak there. So. Well, Rick, this has been fantastic. I, I've really enjoyed this chat uh, again, in, in no small part because, uh, because of our, our shared passions for these things. And uh I look forward to, you know, maybe we'll bump into each other at the APRL and we can just, um, 
you know, uh, go, go on and on about about the uh, the expo and, and Buffalo history for for a lot longer. Absolutely. Well, again, I I, w- I hope to be able to meet you know both you Michael and Charles uh, at a uh, upcoming show. If it's not Chicago this summer, then uh, whatever next summer might bring, or another entity, or the APRL. And again, a real feather in your cap for all that you guys are doing. I mean, uh, I, I've enjoyed uh, conversations. I mean, where else can you hear about the the keeper of the Queen's collection, or <laughs> a post office historian, or you know, mm-hmm. uh, just stamp show uh, reviews. And I, I think you you guys bring a whole lot to the table. And I thank you for it. You're, you're a couple great fellows. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. We, we appreciate, appreciate that. that. We're only as good as our guests. So thank yes. you for, <laughs> for joining. Again, again, this has been a, uh, a really fun chat. I've enjoyed this one a lot. Yeah, great. Absolutely. Best of luck to you both. Thank you. you thank you. Well. we'll see you soon, I hope. All right. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Michael, I really enjoyed that episode. I I realized I was the one doing most of the talking. I hope that's okay. <laughs> no, absolutely. It was it was a learning experience for myself. I feel like I was just one of the uh, one of our listeners. I, well, to, to to make it up to you, I will sit the next one out. Next perfect. interview, you get to do all the talking, and I will just, I'll mute myself the whole time. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, that was super. That was super interesting. I mean, it. I, of course, I didn't. Not being a World's Fair fanatic myself, I, I didn't know a lot or most. It's a of special that kind of. Um, yeah. It's a special kind of. Um, you know, mania. The, yeah. the World's Fair uh, thing. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. use a word that sounds like it's from 1901, mm-hmm. but uh, again, this is one I'm interested in. This this flight to the moon ride uh, in yeah. particular is something I've always been interested in. Have you? Um, so you you said that it went to Coney Island. Have you seen or been on the ride? No, did it you get burnt down. And it, it's just it burnt down by like 1905 or something. Okay, that sounds. This right. was Coney Island at the turn of the century. Yeah, um, it was not the safest place. Mm-hmm. But what's amazing, this ride, you would have gotten into like a, a winged vessel mm-hmm. that would have fluttered, and then I guess they had some effect where it looked like the Earth was getting small. You'd look out the side, and it looked like the Earth was getting smaller, and then you would approach the moon, and you would disembark on the surface of the moon, and they had people dressed up as so was this? You said it burnt down. Was this made out of wood? The Probably. entire ride was made out of wood. Or like asbestos? No, asbestos doesn't asbestos. burn. It was something. It was, it was something. <laughs> but um, do you know what selenites are? I, you're about to show me. I am about to show you. Yeah. Selenites are um, what they thought lived on the moon, basically. Okay. So a, a, a selenite looked more or less like. Um, it's not the little sure, list. green man with sure. two antennas, is it? No. I'm sure our listeners are going to love me uh, Googling. Like, here, these are selenites. They're like like little insect bug creatures. Interesting. That lived on the moon. So so you you disembark on the moon, and the selenites would be there, and there'd be like the selenite king on his selenite throne, mm-hmm. and they would hand you a little piece of cheese, because the moon's made out of cheese, obviously. Yeah. So they, they would actually give you a piece of cheese on the moon, and then you would leave, and then it turns out you weren't actually on the moon. What? Really? Just an amusement park ride. What? Yeah. What kind yeah, of I, I cheese, get, though? Uh, I don't know what uh, variety of cheese it was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can't, man, I can't imagine it would be any sort of like soft cheese because they need to walk around. So maybe it was like a hard cheddar. I want to uh, just clear, uh, Trip to the Moon was designed for the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. Tickets were 50 cents, $15 in today dollars. Mm hmm. It was experienced by over four hundred thousand people. It was one of the. It was the first electrically powered mechanical dark ride, wow. and one of the first space rides. Uh, and then it opened at Luna Park in Coney Island in nineteen oh three. The first version of the ride involved a simulated trip for up to thirty passengers from the fairgrounds to the moon aboard the airship Ornithopter Luna. These are not real sciencey words. These are like mm-hmm. H.G. Wells science yeah. words. We don't yeah. actually have ornithopters. Uh, you left the craft and walked around a cavernous paper mache lunar surface, uh, people uh, peopled by costumed characters playing selenites. There they visited the palace of the man in the moon and his dancing moon maidens before finally leaving the attraction through a moon calf's mouth. Um, I feel like we need more yeah. rides like this. I feel like we did. So it was my dream when I was in like college to rebuild this ride. <laughs> it's a pretty ambitious dream. <laughs> Yeah, I thought this would be cool. Like, like of course, like there's all these crazy inverted roller coasters and everything. But I always yeah. wanted to recreate the a trip to the moon. Paper mache ride. moon. Yeah. Paper mache <laughs> moon. Exactly. Um, 
doesn't say what year it closed. I'm gonna. You mean burned down? <laughs> well, everything burnt down at Coney Island. <laughs> and then they reopened it in 1903, and mm-hmm. then, and then it closed at some point. Hmm. And none of none of these blog posts want to tell me when. Yeah, no, um, nothing talks about its closing. Anyways, this is the whole this is the whole episode we can do about the um, the paper mache lunar surface. Does that not look like fun? That does look like fun. That you know what? That looks like a bar. Well, maybe we could add a alcohol component. Yeah, maybe we could. That on a lot of that work note, must have gone into building that. Yes, for and fifteen dollars a pop. I mean, I don't mean for our entire outro to be uh, talking about one minuscule component of the 1901 World's Fair. Right. But when conversations with philatelist sponsors the reconstruction of the ride, we'll see who's laughing. Yes. Um, it will not be me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be having too much fun on the ride. Yeah, yeah. Screaming. Yes. At the at the uh, the Lunar Palace and the Selenites and the... Selenites, not cellulites. Selen- celluloid is... Um, yeah. Something else entirely. Nice. So, so that's how we'll tie everything up. 1901, you have the World's Fair with this amazing attraction. Yeah. 1902, you have George Millier's trip to the moon. You have the H. G. Wells and Jules Verne's book, Jules Verne books coming out at this time. There mm-hmm. was this era from like 1895 to 1910, I feel, where m- m- lunar travel yeah. was very relevant. You had, um, uh, you know, song, you know, silly little foxtrots being written about lunar travel and yeah. i think this era of american history is so optimistic and innocent and just brilliant yeah um and the film hugo the martin scorsese film that came out it has um uh who's ali g uh sasha baron cohen sasha baron. Yeah. is in it um it, it's a movie about george Melier's life because he ended up selling trinkets in a paris train station after oh. all of his films burnt in a fire and nobody remembered him and the industry moved on without him and by like the teens and twenties, he was broke and forgotten, living in a Paris train station selling wow. little boy toys. Uh, and Hugo wow. is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, so that's why. What year I, was Hugo? 2013, 14. Okay. Um, excellent movie. And again, it all ties into this this wonderful era that the Pan American Exposition was just smack dab in the middle of. Um, you know, when people were still hopeful that they could shoot themselves out of a giant the, the way in like trip to the moon yeah it seems like it was probably a rocket that looked like a like it a was a gun missile. Okay. it was a gun that held a bullet that fit people inside of it and they would launch the gun and the bullet would fly to the moon and then crash into the lunar surface seems safe yeah it's just like apollo 11 <laughs> same same thing <laughs> they actually used a slingshot for that though <laughs> that's basically and, and then to get off the moon basically they fall off a cliff yeah on the they moon just walk and then and fall. the gravity of falling off a cliff on the moon takes them all the way back to earth yeah yeah um yeah it's crazy mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. uh this has been conversations with uh philatelists yeah you might be mistaken you might be confused due to the uh very small amount of philately mentioned in the last uh 20 minutes I, I think this has been a great episode. I really do. Because it, as as I mentioned kind of off camera to you, we, we talk to so many people about stamps, but we never really get to talk to people about stamp related things, things that are, are in, ingrained Trust, in stamps. I can talk about non-stamps all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is. I think this has been a great episode. I think I'd it was a great this. look look into history that, that there were stamps about and I trust trust me I've enjoyed this one thank you yeah. huge thank you to Rick yeah. um, if you're still watching you can uh, find us on Google Apple and Spotify podcasts if yeah. you're still listening you can go back and rewatch this and see what I was holding up to the camera you can see the selenites yeah um, if you uh, go back and watch this on YouTube but uh but yeah or Google of, selenites go, you can Google the word selenite and apparently it's like not just little moon creatures it's like a mineral or something as well so oh. You should probably watch the episode to see the yeah. pictures. I so got. you don't get confused. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, flatterlypodcast.com, flatterlypodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. This is Conversations with Flatterlists. Huge thank you, Michael and uh, and Rick. <laughs> I'll talk to you real soon, Michael. All right. See you then. Bye. Bye.